Romans 5. This is nothing new. So I'm just picking out of the old storehouse stuff. But Romans 5 is uh, describes the progression of events by which hope is sustained or increased upon. Okay, so I'll start from there. So I'm, I'm going to review uh, the topic of hope, the idea of hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when you talk about faith in the Bible, when you talk about hope, uh, in other words, when you talk about hope in, a, in just a sort of a secular sense, uh, to me it's a little different than talking about hope in the spiritual sense, because hope in the spiritual sense has a substance. It has an actual evidence. And that evidence is uh, strengthened and made more and more real by virtue of the experiences we go through, which is what Romans 5 is all about. Um, I'm always uh, reiterating and and it's kind of warning against the uh, magic wand spiritual perception of things. You know, uh, you, you know, you can say, well, I, I ask God for faith. Lord, increase our faith. Right? And he said, well, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you'd say to this mountain, be removed, cast into the sea, and it should obey you. Well, that's an allegory. you got a mountain of trouble in front of you. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, You'd say to that mountain of trouble, ah, sooner or later it's going to pass, God's going to bring me through, be cast into this sea of experiences, you know, it, it, and, and it should obey you. And you can, you can up, obtain a peace and a perspective as though it's already done. <laughs> right? Remember they were toiling and rowing or whatever it was, and, and uh, then all of a sudden the ship immediately was at shore. Well, that's the way it is. I mean, I, you can be in the midst of a great mountain of trouble and trial, and somehow, if you have hope and you have faith, and especially if your hope and your faith has been built upon and strengthened and given increase by virtue of other experiences that God has brought you through, you look back on those experiences, how God brought you through, and that is the evidence that, that you're going to get through this, even though you don't see it. So it's the evidence of things that you don't see yet, you know, based on experiences that God has brought you through, and uh, you can treat it like you're already at the other shore. <laughs> so, uh, faith. And so, so the way hope works in the spiritual sense is, uh, to me, is a little different than the way people talk about it um, carnally. You know, you can hope for things and and d with varying degrees of confidence. But you know, the Bible says. That uh, we'll be saved in the end if we hold our confidence. If we cultivate that hope, if we keep hope, if we hold that confidence steadfast unto the end, what saves you? We are saved by hope. And hope is what motivates you to pursue. And hope is something you have to believe. Not just believe in the possibility of it. Maybe it is and maybe it won't. Isn't. Maybe it'll come to pass and maybe it won't. But eventually... Faith and hope, particularly in the Christian, has to have more substance. It has to have more evidence. It's got to be more sure. It's got to be more confidence. Hope. You know, hope, carnal hope, the, hope can have degrees in things. And we're going to find out as we review hope, hope also is something that we formulate as an expectation. And we hope is something that we set. We set our hope on something. Hope is fundamental to bringing forth the issues, the spiritual issues of life. The spiritual issues that motivate you to pursue something, to obtain a goal. Without hope, you don't do any of that. The, 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 the state of suicide is the person who has no hope. You're saved by hope. You're killed in the absence of hope. If you don't hope in anything, you have no motivation for anything. When I'm in depression, it's because I don't hope. My hopes are dry. They're, 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 
they're deferred. I'm getting sick. I'm losing confidence that the thing I hope for will ever be fulfilled. Therefore, I have no motivation to pursue the hope. Therefore, I might as well just lie in bed all day and <laughs> whatever. Right? Do whatever you do all day in bed. Read a book. Go on the internet or whatever people do. So, let's get back. I want to start with Romans 5. We're justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, we have not obtained or seen or partaken of the full glory of God, right? Well, we've had a down payment. We've had a foretaste. We've had a, the gift of the Holy Ghost. We've had a manifestation of the Spirit, a demonstration of the Spirit. We see glory, so on, in, in, in sort of a, a smaller measure. But we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. Patience, experience, and experience hope. And this is the formula. This is the formula to increase in your faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now I have faith to be saved in the end. I have faith for my soul to be saved. And, and I had faith, that faith grows stronger and stronger and the confidence grows more and more perfect every time God saves me from some episode in this life. If I get into trouble in this life and God saves me out of it, you know, Let's say uh, I made a bad mistake in the job and uh, it's going to be catastrophic. Let's just say something seemingly insignificant but sort of illustrates the pattern. Well, I'm at a job one day and uh, I'm putting up a range hood and the range hood is over a stove and the stove has a glass top on it. And little Sister Wisdom whis whispered in my ear, move that stove out of the way in case you drop the range hood. And uh, proud Jonathan answered back in his thoughts, ah, I'll be careful. I'll never drop that range hood. So here I am. And guess what happens? Da -da. Uh, duh, I dropped the range hood. <laughs> Crash. Brand new stove. Countertop is cracked. So now that is, I'm in trouble. It's somebody else's brand new stove and I broke it. Now I'm going to lose money. I'm, so then it, it, it gets worse. Oh, how much to replace the cooktop? Well, we're calling around and it's a, $399 just for the glass top and they only paid four five twenty five for the stove. So it's three ninety nine a hundreds for shipping and then you know, it looks like I'm gonna have to buy them a whole new stove. Well, so what happened was uh God gave me and I'll give God the glory, God gave me the ability to search around and find a a a, a lower priced counter uh, glass top the uh, the hotel owner who I was working for where we were renovate we were renovating a few rooms for his nephew to to move in uh, into a few rooms in a hotel they were renovating them into an apartment for him to live in so he could be a live-in manager at the hotel now this this man who I was working for God turned his heart to say oh Jonathan you didn't do that on purpose it was only an accident so I'll pay for the repair. Can you imagine that? I didn't ask for anything. He just, nope, nope, you're not. I will pay for the repair. So God turned the man's heart to deliver me out of trouble, right? Well, that's just a little thing, isn't it? But it had the elements here. I got myself into tribulation. And in the tribulation, I had to have patience. I had to endure through the fear and the reproach and what's going to happen and can I fix this myself or am, am I going to lose a bunch of money? And, and at the end, uh, it, yeah, tribulation. So then I had to have patience. And then after, after I had patience, God turned the heart of the hotel owner to uh, sort of get me off the hook, if you will. And that became an experience that I saw God turn the man's heart to have favor towards me and that God was able to put grace on the situation. And uh, that's an experience that I had, right? So it involved tribulation, patience. It became an experience. And now guess what happens the next time I get in trouble? I'll remember this experience. Yeah. I'll say, I'll remember this experience and it'll help me to have more hope in God, right? Tribulation, <laughs> yeah, patience, experience, 
and hope. Hope. It's, it, it ends up with hope and it strengthens hope. It gives you more confidence in God. It proves that God can come through. God can deliver. God can save. Now God's going to demonstrate all that stuff in, in, in the issues of our life for a little while, but God wants us to mature into the point where we our hope is co- and confidence is in Him to bring us forth in all the spiritual issues that are important. Now He'll demonstrate it in the things of this life so that it can cultivate the hope in us and make it stronger and stronger. Lord, increase our faith. Well, here's I'm getting back to what I said in the first place. This is why... I am not a fan of magic wand uh, promoting a perception of magic wand Christianity. Lord, increase our faith. Abracadabra, poof, you have more faith. No, that's not how it works. Lord, increase our faith. Okay, well then, learn how to glory in tribulations, and then you'll have to have patience, and that patience will result in an experience that I bring you through, and that will give you more hope. And faith is the substance of things hope for and you'll have more faith and that's how you get more faith by getting God to put this big mountain of trouble in front of you I see this big mountain of trouble in front of me I said no trying to dis- it's trying to discourage me but God I remember what God did the last time I, I, I had that mountain in, in front of me be removed and cast into the sea and it won't, I'll, the mountain will still be there I'm still going to have to have patience and go through that mountain of trouble of experience. But as far as in my soul, it's a done deal. It's all, I'm already delivered based on what God brought me through last time. And so therefore, it, that kind of hope, that kind of hope is, is something that's already been nurtured and cultivated. Remember we were talking about God uh, having sons and bringing many sons to perfection and all of that and how... Uh, with Jesus Christ, the uniqueness with Jesus Christ as compared to Melchizedek or Adam who were both called sons of God or like sons of God, that's that God said to Jesus, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten you. And this is part of how God begets us, bringing us through these experiences. And that's how faith grows in your heart. And the same thing with wisdom. Any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Because he that wavereth is like the waves of the sea, tossed and so on and so forth. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And let him not that man think he will receive anything of the Lord. But you, you have, uh, if you need wisdom, let him ask. God will give liberally and upbraideth not. But ask nothing wavering. Don't waver when you ask for wisdom. Because if you ask for wisdom, the only way you get wisdom is by virtue of experiences. Well, what kind of experiences? The ones here in Romans chapter 5. The tribulation experiences. That's how you're going to get wisdom. So when you ask for wisdom, no one's going to make a, a wave a magic wand and say, you now have wisdom. Now, I will say this though. If I say, uh, you know, if you ask God for wisdom, God may say, Right away, I've given you wisdom, but it still has yet to be manifested and has to come to pass and get ready. If God said, I've given you wisdom, then God is also preceded that by, <laughs> you can expect God is also going to give you a whole bunch of experiences and troubles and tribulations by which it will fulfill what God said, that I will give you wisdom. That's why you ask nothing wavering. Don't waver. Anyway, th- this is the whole thing. Is everything with God is like that. And it came to pass in process of time. And it came to pass in process of time. Remember the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins. Right? Give us of your oil. Well, we don't. We only have enough for ourselves. We can't have for... We don't have enough for us and for you. You go out and buy. You go out and buy. You go out and go through your process of time. You go out and go through your experiences of tribulation, patience, experience, and hope, and then have the oil of joy and hope in your hearts. Go buy yourself. Buy, buy for yourself. See, it's not a magic wand. Those guys had to go out and go through something that takes a process of time to cultivate and develop something within them, which would result in the springing forth of the Holy Ghost oil from within them, and they would have enough for themselves. And that's the way you... Uh, but we're, we're in the instant generation. 
right? We're in the instant yeah. generation. We're, our perception of things is, I want something, there it is. All right. Um, so that's patience, experience, experience, hope. Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given, on, given unto us. And that scripture, when the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, the, the, uh, the greatest fulfillment of that scripture is when you're discouraged or your hope is challenged or your hope is deferred and the Holy Ghost will shed abroad a witness in your heart by reminding you of all these things in the past that you've been, that He brought you through. And that is what makes, what, that is what gives Romans ch uh, chapter 5, verse 5, the most meaning and significance is when you've already had experiences and the Holy Ghost can not only just give you sort of a witness of the love of God, but can, can confirm that by showing you how much God loved you and brought you through and all of these things that God has done for you and proved himself in the past, but in, uh, in many previous experiences, that's what gives the shedding of the love of God abroad in your hearts true meaning. And that's where it, it's... What we're looking for is we're looking for a, a very, very strong, cultivated, ever-increasing confidence of hope that's related to faith. And this is how it is developed. So, uh, and peace, you know, like this, the, the Romans 5 starts by saying if we're justified by faith, we have peace with God. And I always, this is my perception of it, uh, this is my experience that, that peace, a lot of the time, peace is not that hard to obtain, at least for me. You know, I can be troubled and I'll go to the Lord in prayer and I'll get a visitation of the Holy Ghost and I'll remember scriptures and things will happen and I'll settle down and I'll get some peace. And that wasn't too hard for me, that exercise. It's not always that difficult. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Most of the time for me it isn't. The difficulty I have is to hold my peace. Something else is going to try to take it away again. You know, if I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battles... So Jesus says, My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Your peace is not going to be uh, an eliminating of the troubling circumstance. That's not our peace. My peace, not as the world giveth I unto you. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of a good cheer, because I have overcome the world. So if I have overcome the world then you will overcome the world. Whosoever is, is begotten of God overcometh the world. Whoever is begotten of God. What does it mean, begotten of God? Remember, I'll say it again. When you're begotten of God, you are hand-led. You are personally led by the Holy Ghost through this series, this exercise of tribulation, patience, experience, and hope. That's how you get begotten. And if you go through that and you are begotten, then whosoever is begotten of God overcometh the world. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne as I am set in my Father's throne. And you can go on and on from the book of Revelations in the churches to the letters to the churches there. So hope, a dictionary definition of hope is to wish for something with expectation of its fulfillment. That's a pretty basic generic definition you know to have confidence to have trust to look forward to with confidence or expectation to expect that is hoped for or desired one that is a source of or reason for hope then it gives a theological definition of hope which is it's all right the theological virtue hope is the theological virtue let's call it the spiritual virtue okay Hope is the spiritual virtue defined as the desire and search for future good that's difficult but not impossible to attain with God's help. Well, that's getting better, right? That's not bad. 
So, our faith is going to be tried. Our hope is going to be tried. You know the condition of Ezekiel 37, uh, the valley of dry bones, right? We are, our bones are dried up. We are cut off for our part. Our hope is lost. These bones, can these bones live? These bones are dry. Lo, they are very dry. Well, I can relate to that. These past two or three years, lots of times things were very dry. Very dry. Didn't seem like any hope of what I was hoping for in, you know, spiritual fulfillments or what have you. Your walk with God, the fulfillment of whatever you're called to do. Very dry, very dry. It's not so much now as a, maybe a year or so ago, but, and that's the way the Valley of Dry Bones is. And we're, we're talking and relating to all this stuff in terms of hope. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen and uh, by hope we are saved. For we are saved by hope. For hope that is seen, carnally seen or perceived, hope that is seen is, is not yet hoped. For if a man has what he hopes for, then why does he yet hope for it? But if we have not what we hope for, then do we with patience wait for it. And the key here is that God wants us subject to have to look to Him and wait on Him for the fulfillment of hope, which involves a period of time that tries our hope, tests our hope, where we, we need to maintain an embrace and a holding on to the confidence that we have in God to fulfill a godly hope. Now, a godly hope is, Lord, save my soul. You know, what must I do to be saved? Lord, save me. That is a godly hope. You know, Lord, give me a good job. That is not a godly hope. Because you know, the fundamental uh, approach of faith, you know what that is in Matthew 5. Don't take any thought what you eat, what you'll drink, wherewithal you shall be clothed. For the Gentiles do all that, and they're all bought troubled about all those things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And that's it. As a, as a spiritual people, with a spiritual perspective, embracing the things that are eternal, uh, setting our affections on the things that are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God, you know, like the Queen of Sheba communing with Solomon, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, our concern and care about what gets fulfilled in this life should be dwindling, dwindling. It should be diminishing. It should be dying off. And our concern should be what's being fulfilled in the spiritual realm, in the perfection of the saints, in the cultivating of our relationships, in our preparation to meet God and inherit eternal life, to go on to perfection. That's the way it always is. And that has to be renewed. You know, as many... Uh, and any man that, we, we're going to see Jesus as he is. And any man that has this hope in him, this is the hope that we'll see Jesus as he is. Well, if we're going to recognize Jesus and be able to relate to and identify and perceive and recognize him as he is, our ability to do that is going to be based on the fact that we're like him. So every man that has this hope purifies himself even as Jesus is pure. All right, so I'll bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. This is Psalm 16, by the way, verses 7 to 9. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. So when my flesh is troubled at the circumstances or my flesh is troubled with anything, temptation or whatever's coming my way because of the flesh, the Bible says my flesh can rest and shall rest in hope that God will bring me through, right? Just like the Bible says, uh, and I quote this once in a while, that uh, 
If our heart condemns us not, we have confidence with God. But if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and He knows all things. If my heart condemns me, maybe it's harder for me to have confidence that God would ever want to help me. Or, but, and yet, the Bible says, if my heart condemns me, God is greater. And, and hope, hope will transcend that, that uh, discouragement of self-condemnation and say, look, salvation of, is of the Lord. This thing is up to God. Even though my heart condemns itself, if I can acknowledge that eternal life is, is what, what I'm after, and that's the only thing that's pertinent to our existence is that we obtain eternal life, then God is greater than even my self-condemnation and He can somehow work this out until I get back to a place of confidence. If that's what God wants to do, He can do that. Right? Now I'm putting it off on God. If He wants to do it, He can. Now let us go on to perfection and this is what we do if, if God allows it. Right? God does have total control over this whole thing. He has complete power over everything. And so, that's what we hope. And of course, we have about the, 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 the account of Abraham in Romans 4. And, you know, Abraham was past the, uh, Sarah was past, past the year of childbearing and all of that stuff, and yet God said he's going to have a, a chosen seed out of his own loins. He's going to bring forth a son, and that, that's the child of promise. That's Isaac. That was the seed singular that God promised and from which Christ came, the seed of Abraham. And you know that whole thing in Romans and Galatians. But uh, Abraham, who against hope, everything was against hope. He believed in hope. If I can't find a specific directed target of hope, a, sp uh, a vision of hope, a description of something particular to hope for, I can just believe in hope. Yeah, you can. You can just simply believe in hope. I don't know where. I don't know how. I don't know why. I don't know when. I don't know if. I, I don't know anything about any of that stuff. But if God be pleased to somehow do something on my behalf eventually, because that's His good pleasure, I'll just have a hope in that hope in God. Sometimes that's got to be enough. And that's what Abraham, who against hope, he believed in hope. We have to believe in hope. We have to believe in hope will do the job. Hope will keep us motivated. Hope will keep us in our confidence towards God. Hope will keep us in a pursuit of eternal life. Hope will have a payoff. It'll have a dividend. It'll have a result if you stick with it long enough. If you have patience. You have need of patience, and your patience possess your soul. If you hold your confidence steadfast unto the end, even against everything that testifies against hope, hope and hope. Yeah. That's what Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope. Why is my soul disquieted in me? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Hope thou in God. Didn't say much, much more particular or deliberate or specific than that. Just hope in God. Well, I'll just hope that God somehow will bring something to pass on my behalf. I'll just hope in God. I got to hope in something. If I don't hope in anything, what's that? That's death. That's suicide. That's... That's the state of the suicidal person. No hope. If there's no hope, there's no life. If there's no life, then why should you exist? Is there's no meaning of life? There's no nothing to live for? What, what's the purpose? What's the point? Of course, that is the way the devil lets the spirit of suicide work in you to become suicidal. But we're not like that. We, we always have hope, some kind of hope. There's got to be some kind of hope. Work. Even, the, even the patriarchs and the prophets, and we talked about this before, how they all went through, uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations went through it, Job went through it, others went through it. It is the taste of death. When you feel like a Jonah, Jonah in the uh, belly, whale, belly of the whale, of the fish, or whatever you want to call it, in the belly of hell, in other words, they all went through it, didn't they? 
They actually made the declaration and they had the thoughts and they made the, they uttered the statements. Then I said, I am cut off from before your eyes. How about Jesus in the garden? God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Cut me off. And yet, Jonah said, you know, the waters have gone over my head. Then I said, I am cut off from before thy eyes. Yet I will look towards thy holy place or thy holy mountain or whatever he said. I don't remember exactly what he said. But you get the idea. Even after having, have, having to deal with so much lack of confidence, you became convinced momentarily that you're cut off. But there's something inside there that God put in from the beginning. There is a seed. There's a seed of hope that God has in there in every elect child of God. And that hope is going to still look to God. Now, hope is something, again, that's fundamental. Hope is something that you said it. You said it. Um, so, Psalm 78. Um, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will, okay. Give your, O my people, unto my law. Incline your ears to the word of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Um, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. For he established the testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God. So hope is something you set. And we're instructed, set your hope in God. Set your hope in the things that pertain to God. Set your hope in things that are spiritual. Set your affection on things above. So in other words, you know, I'm not going to hope that if I give a minister a thousand dollars, I'll get ten thousand back. That's not setting my hope in God. <clears throat> but if I do say, well, I hope somehow I got myself into this mess here. I hope God will get me out. And I hope it will result in the fact that I get even more confidence and hope and strength and trust and God, and that will cause me to even love Him more. And the fact that I saw Him bring me through the experience will, will result in the love of God being shed abroad in my heart, which will increase my confidence for the next trial. You know, this, this is an exercise. This is an exercise. Uh, no chastening seems uh, joyous for the present, but grievous ne neither, ne nevertheless afterwards. It yields the peaceable fruit of uh, righteousness to them who are their yeah, go, going through it again. Let the man of low degree rejoice that he's exalted, but the rich that he is made low. And this is the Psalm 107. Go up and you go down, and you go up and you go down. It's the exercise. God brings you down. He brings you low. And when you're, when you're, you're low, it is the um, inspiration God's trying to create in you to look and hope in God because you're low, you're, 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 you're in trouble, you're needy, you need help, you're, 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 you're looking to God. We don't know what to do, Lord, but we're looking on you, right? And then God brings you out, and then you get all confident again, and then, you know, and then, as the Bible says, uh, in their prosperity, they forgot God. So when you get rich, you tend to forget God. You tend to slack off a bit sometimes and get confident again in, in your state or in the flesh or whatever. And then so if you're rich, rejoice that God will bring you low again so that you can be exercised in all of this stuff. Um, and then, of course, as we go on and on, you know, uh, when we start off, we're more stubborn than if, 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 if we are going to perfection and if we are responding righteously to the operation of God when we first start start we're a little more ignorant and we're a little more stubborn God's got to bring us lower and then when he brings us back out we tend to get really high we get puffed up about it and we get a little too we go too high and then God brings us back down again but as we go through the cycle eventually it should sort of level off where the more mature you get the less God has to bring you down. Because as soon as, when you get mature, 
God just has to start bringing you down. And all of a sudden, oh, I see God starts just starting to bring me down again. That's like what happened the last time and the time before and the time before. And you're quicker to humble yourself. And you don't tend to get as puffed up after you get delivered this time. Cause, and things sort of level out until you become a perfect man. But anyway, you have to set your hope in God and not forget the works of God. You don't set your hope in the things of this life. And so uh, part of what, you, you know how the Bible says uh, that uh, they healed the daughter of, of the, the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying they're... It, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. And it talks about how um, God's people are sick. And Isaiah, right, they're sick. From the head even onto the foot, there's no soundness in the body. But just wounds and putrefying sores. Because the body is sick. Right from the head to the feet, the body is sick. Now let's look at that in terms of hope. Hope deferred makes the heart sick hope deferred you mean you're hoping for something and if you're hoping for something specifically and it doesn't come to pass then your hope is being challenged as to whether you should even hope in it anymore at all or not yeah. and you're challenged you're tempted to let go of that hope well if your hope isn't set in God it's not set in God if your hope is in something carnal well, then may God forbid you the fulfillment of that hope and it may make you so sick that you let go of that hope and so that you reset your hope in God and something eternal. Well, that would be all right. And that's the whole operation of God. The old man hopes in the things in this life. The old man hopes in things for himself. He hopes in ambition. He hopes in the pride of life. He hopes in the fulfillment of lusts and other things. And God has to kill that. Get us to transfer our hope. As we said before, if God brings you to the end of your carnal hope, everybody, everybody and every creature that exists fights for life, right? Even the smallest little bug, if you injure a bug and you try to go after a cockroach or some little thing, it's scrambling and running away and it's fighting for its life. And our old man's like that too. Our old man has his, his hopes in this life and, and he, he doesn't want to let them go. <laughs> He wants to just hang on to those hopes in this life and God has to bring us low until we let go of the hope. Well, the reason, one of the reasons people don't want to let go of their hopes is because people perceive that if they let go of their hope, then, then there's nothing left to live for. I mean, if my hope is in raising a, a nice family and uh, getting a job and living in some urban town and uh, having a good family, family life with three kids and a dog named Spot like all the rest of the Americans do or the American dream or whatever you want to call it you know then uh, if that's uh, unfulfilled well then the heart grows sick well what I'm saying is the heart doesn't want to let go of hope because somehow intuitively the heart recognizes that if I have no hope I have no life in simplicity. But we have to embrace that if we lose this hope, we can we get a better hope. We are resurrected onto a lively hope. Our hope is a lively hope. And our hope has a substance and it has an evidence. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. And how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God and that's what we do. We preach and we talk about the Word of God and faith in, in God saving us and bringing us through an operation that perfects us and it, it, it begins to uh, stimulate the confidence in our minds. It's, it, oh, because, because the Word of God is quick. It's powerful. There's an anointing behind it. If a man is really called to preach, then he has an anointing preaching, and you have an anointing to understand, and there is a vivid imp impact and impression. The words of the wise are like goads, the Bible says. Goads are like nails, if you can, like a carpenter hitting a nail, fastened by the master of assemblies. 
And that's the impact and the authority and the intensity of preaching, taking the principles and instilling and bringing up and, and letting faith come up by the preaching of the word, hitting the principles of God. Impact, 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 blow after blow, so that these principles of hope and faith and salvation and God have a purchase in you. Right? When you drive a nail, you drive it in so that you can't take it back out again. So the nail sticks in there. And to do that, you have to swing and give it a blow. All right. So that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. You have to set your hope in God. And might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God, refused to walk in His law, and forgot His works and His wonders that He showed them. Okay, so you have to have your, you have to set your hope. Hope is something you set. You set your hope on something. Right? So I, I was growing up as a young man, and I said, well, what's there to live for? I need something to hope in. I looked around and you know, I want to be accepted by all my friends. And I felt like I was a reject, you know. People used to tease me at school. They used to call me because I was skinny, and they'd tease me and call me names Bony and Toothpick, and that really got to me, and I felt like a reject, and I was craving to be accepted. You know, the devil was already working in my heart to the fear of death. I was afraid of rejection. You know, think of the, how the devil holds us bondage all our lifetime through the fear of death. Think of that fear of death, not in terms so much of fear of physical death, but fear of rejection from everybody else. Because when you're rejected by everybody else, then, then you're alone. You're isolated and you're tormented. And every, every heart that God ever lets come into this world in a fleshly body craves and desires and pursues some kind of harmony or joining to or unity or fellowship or acceptance, or, or honor from without to give it so it so that to give itself a sense of it, a meaning for existing, <laughs> right? So those are fundamental things that work in every heart. And I was looking for acceptance. I felt rejected, looking for acceptance, and so I had to set my hope in something. So what's going on? Well, all my friends are listening to hard rock music, and they idolize the hard rock uh, music stars. So, oh, well, I hope that maybe, uh, maybe I'll, I hope that maybe I'll, I'll be able to learn how to play rock guitar and be just like those rock stars. And if I could be just like those rock stars, all my friends will accept me. I'm setting my hope. And that hope is bringing forth an issue of life to pursue after musical ability. What do I want musical ability for? So I can get the acceptance of my friends. You know, among other things too, some people that at what at least to a certain degree it was to try to to impress women too. You know, rock stars are known for that, right? So as, as I, when I was young, it didn't start it didn't start with that that motivation. But as I got into late teen 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 uh, ages, that that um, that promise of uh, you know getting women and relationships with women and impressing them with your rock star status became part of the motivation, became part of the hope. But anyway, that's, that's a hope. I, I, and I had to set my hope. I had, my hope had, had to have a vision. It began to take a vision, a particular vision. Without a vision, the people perish. And somewhere I, there had to be uh, evidences and things and indications that came to me that would give me confidence that I could actually do this. And so what happened was, uh, I took guitar lessons when I was 10 years old and I overheard the guitar teacher tell my parents, wow, your son is, you know, he's much more talented musically than most people at 10 years old. And if, if I were you, I would, I would cultivate this in him. And it, so then it gave me confidence. Hey, maybe I'm talented. Maybe I can pull this off. All right. But anyway, the idea is there is that I was setting my hope. I was setting it. And by setting my hope, it began to form a vision of something for me to pursue. 
And again, that's why we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves. That's why we rehearse all the principles of God and the purpose of God, renew it in our minds over and over again, because we got to make this vision of spiritual hope. We have to keep the image bright, <laughs> right? I mean, we could, it's like a TV set. The TV set produces an image, right? Well, I used to fix TVs, and uh, you could have the image being produced perfectly upon the screen, but the backlight is burned out. It had no light behind it. So it, so it was there, but you really couldn't see it enough to pay attention to it. You had to keep the light behind it to keep emphasizing the image. So you have to keep preaching the light of the God's Word to keep <laughs> impressing the image, to keep it in view, to keep it illuminated. Even though it's in your heart, you've got to have it illuminated. You have to have a backlight behind it, constantly brightening it to make it obvious to you so you can dwell on it so that your hope and your vision, you start to get a heavenly vision. Without a vision, the people perish. If we don't have a vision of the hope of eternal life, we're all going to perish. All right. So we have to uh, desire the things of God. I'll turn, turn this to a little bit to the uh, idea of desire. You know, many times I keep coming back to that vision that Brother Stair played. The sister had the vision of the wounded sheep. And uh, the wounded sheep, in, in that vision, there were sheep that were wounded and their desire had died. Their desire had died. And I think in the vision she said something like, well, how do they get their desire back? And he said, well, the sheep have to focus on me. They have to focus on me. And then the desire will come. Uh, through desire, not, do, you, do you desire eternal life? Yes, that's a rhetorical question. I'm sure you all desire eternal life. I desire eternal life. And if I want and desire eternal life, if I'm going to pursue and apprehend eternal life, apprehend that for which I'm also apprehended of Christ Jesus, if I'm going to do that, then I have to believe it's possible. I have to have a confidence. So how do you get the confidence? Well, it starts with the preaching, right? We talk about all this stuff, and, we, and then it also comes by virtue of experiences. We start preaching, and we say, well, God really can save to the uttermost, huh? This is worth pursuing. And then you get this, a desire for it. Well, you know, what are we going to do? We're, we're going to become, what's in it for us? Well, we, we're going to become judges. Well, that's what he said to Peter, right? You're going to be judges sitting on the 12 thrones. Paul said to the saints, you guys are going to judge the world. Don't you know that you shall judge holy angels? Don't you know you have a high calling? Don't you know you're going to see and partake of the glory of God? Now, I remember as a young, la young lad sitting in the backyard looking up at the stars in the sky and having that intuitive, built-in, innate sense that there is a God. Because how could all this come from nothing? And looking at the vastness of the universe and the stars and just thinking... I want to see whoever it is that made all of this. It would be, it has to be amazing. You know, <laughs> just really just as a young, just a young kid, just sort of enthralled uh, in a simple way with the vastness of God. And that was a desire. One thing have I desire. desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. One thing, you know, if the eye is single... If the only thing you desire is the things of God, then your whole body's full of light. Right? So, Psalm 42, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? We've had people say that. Right? Where are they now? You know, I've been in fellowships where they, they, they challenge the preachers that, that aren't there anymore and try to compare themselves to the preachers that aren't there anymore. And you never hear from them anymore. Where are they? Well, who, who, who says where are they? I mean, we're here. <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing our, we're brightening the little corner where we are, doing the will of God. It's like I say, you don't have to have a super fantastic uh, national or worldwide profile to be fulfilling the will of God and everybody know about it. 
right? As a matter of fact, we keep emphasizing the opposite about that poor, old, poor wise man who by his wisdom delivered the city and nobody knew, the, nobody remembered the poor wise man. So you see, it's not always like things are, are not always like as they appear. So, where is thy God? Well, I, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and pray and with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? It's a question. You cast down or are you depressed? I am. I've gone through all kinds of it. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's right, but I'm just saying I go through it sometimes. Depression. Why are you depressed? Because your heart is sick. Because your hopes are deferred. <laughs> so either you need more patience, you have need of patience, and eventually your hopes, your godly, spiritual, righteous hopes will be fulfilled. Either that or your hope is not set in God. It's got to be one of the two. So it's a good question. Begs to be answered. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted, stirred up, troubled, in turmoil, needing peace, and lack, having a lack of peace? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. Again, nothing in particular, just hope in God. I just hope God does what? I don't know, something. When? I don't know. Why? I just, if he, because if he, just if he wants to do it. When? Whenever he wants. Just hope in God. Sometimes hope got to take that form. Especially when we're in process of God, where God's trying to dissolve our ungodly hopes and things, our hopes are fading before us and we're not sure what the heck's going on. And Am I saved? Will I ever finish my course? Will I ever fulfill my calling? Is this all there is? You know, well, hope in God. I shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. And then again, the same thing, that was Psalm, uh, did I just read that? Yeah, I just got a duplicate there. Now, talking about hope and everything in terms of uh, uh Having substance, and faith is, is, again, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The more substance your faith has, the more confident your hope becomes. And your hope becomes more and more confident by drawing upon the past experiences that God has brought you through. That's the Romans 5 thing, right? Tribulation. Patience, experience, and you're left with hope because you came through the experience. And then after you go through all that, you see, now the next trial, like I say, you're going to have hope for your next trial, but that hope is going to have all kinds of substance, all kinds of evidence, even though the particular trial you're in, you, 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 you're, not, uh, you're still hoping for the fulfillment of it. Yet it's full of substance, it's full of evidence. And therefore, the confidence is extremely strong. Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Confident, in spite of Sarah being dead in her womb. Abraham being so old, he was an old Fogey could probably hardly perform. Yet, he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. I will yet praise you for your help, help of your countenance, like Psalm 42 there. Still praising God. Oh, I said I am cut off from before your eyes, Jonah said. Yet will I look toward thy holy temple. Yet will I have hope in God. I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. And therefore, it becomes, it, hope transforms into something that you sort of weakly may hope that happens. And finally, it matures into something that you know is going to happen. I know this is going to happen. It's not a blind confidence. It's supported by experience. It's, export, it's, it's supported by preaching. It's supported by the Word of God. It's supported by the witness of the Spirit. 
the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. Now I'm going to end off uh, by talking about the, uh, I, I just have here, we know. These are things that we know. Okay, and it pertains to hope, but it also pertains to other things too. And, and uh, well, let's, let's start with the Romans 8.28 thing. For we know that, for we no. know that all things, all things, well, how do you know that? Because oh God, because uh, Joe Blow told me, and I'm I'm hoping he's right. He may I don't know, he may be right, and he may be wrong. I don't know because uh, I've only known him for two or three years. But uh, he said it, so I'm hoping maybe it's possible. You know. Well, that's not very strong confidence, is it? You see what I mean? Come back so, to the experience. Right, come back to the experience. For we know that we know that that's way more established. That is utterly full of substance. That that is that is that is evident. That somebody that oh it is evident to me the evidence of things not seen. We know that all things work together for good to them that are the call to God to them that are called of God. Them that are uh, that know God to them that are called according to His purpose. You know, it's something where your heart waxes sort of stronger and stronger and stronger and more confident and more confident the more you go through your walk with God and your experience with God. So, you you know, uh, no one's going to be without excuse. We know. This is, this is the last part of the message here. We know. There's lots of things that we know. It's not maybe, possibly, there's a possibility that. It seems to me it could be that. Nope. No, I'm sorry. We're talking about maturity in, in a Christian walk where you know. You have enough experience that you know. So let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know. And the way, you know. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Because you know, he's, he's thinking of a physical place. Where, you, you, where are you going? And Jesus talking about the way of eternal life. Follow Jesus. Right? So Jesus always had that issue with his disciples before they got the Holy Ghost. You know. Oh, oh, is it because we didn't take bread? You know, Jesus says, you know, beware the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. Oh, is it because we didn't take any bread? Jesus says, what's wrong with you guys? You know, when I broke the bread and everything, and you, how many baskets of fragments did you take up? You mean you can't remember that this issue is not about physical bread? I can make physical bread forever, you know. I can give that increase. I could have made you gather 1,200 baskets full of fragments. How is it that you didn't understand I was spiritualizing and talking about the leaven, the doctrine of the scribes? So he always had that issue with, with his people before they got the Holy Ghost. So Thomas says, uh, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, the most you know, famous scripture, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, sorry Muslims and Hare Krishnas and Hindus and what have you, and Mormons and whatever, or any other name, or atheists. Or If you had known me, you should have known my father also, and from henceforth you do know him and have seen him. So here's people, Thomas and the disciples, they have yet to realize what they know. <laughs> So God has to bear you witness of what you know. See, these disciples have already been through a lot of experiences with Jesus. And there's enough experience in their heart for them to know. But it needs a confirmation. It needs a, uh, um, a renewing and a regenerating and a sustaining. All right, so show us the Father and it sufficeth, sufficeth us 
Jesus says, Have I been so long time with you, and, and, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that seen me has seen the Father. Okay, now I'm talking about things that we know. Things that we know. The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. Okay, and then Paul says in Corinthians, so, you know, when your heart is bitter, hey, you know, if you want to really be honest, go down in your quiet time, in your prayer time, where you have no, not, no, uh, the reproach of men is not an issue because you're by yourself and you can be honest with, before yourself and God and everything. And when your heart is bitter, you know it. You know, the heart knows its own bitterness. As it's written in 1 Corinthians 2 now, Eyes not seen, neither ear heard, neither enter into the heart of man the things God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. What man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And that's what... You know, what things knows the man save the spirit of man within him? So the man, the spirit of man within him knows when he is bitter or knows when he has confidence with God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, the spirit which is of God, but we might know that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And... In Isaiah 59, it is, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, that the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. He goes on and on. And at the end of that, near the end of that, in verse 12, talks about how judgment's far from us, and uh, we groping for the wall like blind men, like we have no eyes, and we stumble at noonday. Like we're in the night and we're in desolate places. We roar like bears. We mourn like doves. We look for judgment, but there's none. Salvation seems so far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them. We know them. Yeah, we know them. This is the whole thing, is to discover and identify sins and iniquities so that... It's not some kind of, you know, confession is, I, I don't know what I think of this ultimately, but I think it's a pretty weak thing to say, well, God, if I have, you know, if there's something I don't see, you know, please forgive me. Well, that, that may be a good starting point, I guess, but really what we're after is that, oh my God, I have sinned and I've done wickedly. I did this particular thing. I know exactly what it is. Now I realize how bad it fell out and how much it affected me and other people and, so on and so forth. And, and yeah, as for our iniquities, we know them. We have to get to the point where we realize what we've done. Okay, who, knowing the judgment of God, we, pre we preached a little bit on this last week, who knowing the judgment of God that they commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What We know the judgment of God? We, knowing. These are all things that we know. Now here's, here's someone who didn't know. Cain, where is Abel thy brother, God says. He says, I don't know. <laughs> Am I my brother's keeper? And, uh, you know, the uh, prayer of Solomon when he dedicated the temple. If there be dearth on the land, pestilence, blasting, mildew, locusts, caterpillars, if there's enemies besieging in the, land of, in the cities of the land, whatever sore or whatever sickness there be, then what prayer or what supplication shall ever be made of any man or of all thy people, Israel, when every man shall no. know his own sore and his own grief. Wow, I'm just really in a rough state. I'm just really sore. I'm in a bad state. I hurt and I'm full of rejection and I'm this and I'm that. I'm wounded and I'm just so sore that I've gone around to times saying, God, you know, I just, sometimes I feel like I'm a rabid animal. Just people, t all people have to do is touch me and I blast off on them. You know, you know how a rabid animal is, right? A rabid animal doesn't, all the, it, it, just get close to a rabid animal and he's going to snap at you and bite you, tear you up for no reason at all because he's, rabid animal is mad. It's, he's mad. He's sore. He's diseased. That's what we're like when we're very sore, wounded, sore wounded in our hearts. 
right? Remember I sort of made, made the comparison of, I don't know, a guy with a sore shoulder? You know, a normal act of uh, kindness would be to pat you on the shoulder and say, how are you doing, brother? But if I'm sore, if I have a real bad bruise on my shoulder, you could just affectionately tap me on the shoulder to greet me, but to me it would be the cause of a great source of pain and I might lash out and lash out at you. Say, ow, stop that, leave me alone! <laughs> because I, I'm so sore, the least little touch results in me feeling pain. Well, we're sore. When everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hand in this place. That's a prerequisite to forgiveness when you know your own sore. Jesus, knowing that the Father has given all things into his hand. You know, that's the other thing about as we come to perfection and maturity and stature, then we know. We know these things. We know. Did Jesus suppose he was the Son of God? Did Paul felt led that it's possible God might be putting him as an apostle? I think I'll try it out and see. Is that, is that the kind of weak confidence Paul had? Or No, Paul knew who he was. And, Beloved, we know we are of God. See, we know. All right. Knowing the terror of the Lord, Paul said, we persuade men. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. And all Israel from Dan per Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. These are things that we understand. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so things were, which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Not rendering evil for evil, Peter says, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that that's there, where you there, are, there unto our call, and that you should inherit a blessing. Satan is standing at God's right hand to resist us as Joshua the high priest clothed in filthy garments. Whom resist? Resist the devil and he shall flee from you. Whom resist steadfast in, in, in the faith knowing, what do you know? Your brethren are going through all the same things you're going through. The same afflictions are accomplished with your brethren. You're not the only one. Nobody knows what I'm going through. No, that's not really true. Most of the time there's people, and maybe you don't know particularly who, maybe it's the particular people around you don't seem to uh, demonstrate that they understand what you're going through. But you can know that Jesus understands, Jesus knows, and you know that the same afflictions are accomplished by your brethren. So that's all this stuff about knowing. And, and this is the emphasis I'm making. I'm just going to wind it up here, bring us right back to Romans 5. We glory in tribulation also, knowing that. See, that's a sure thing. Knowing is evident. It's substantive. It has substance. It's not weak. It's strong. We know. I know the Lord can make a way for me. I know God is able to save to the uttermost. If I set my affection on things above, if I set my hope in God, if I incline my heart, if I get to the place where my heart is fixed, if I really want to be saved, God can save. To the, I know that God can do this. I've been through tribulation, patience, experience, so on and so forth. And that's the strength that hope has to have in the spiritual realm. It has to, has to come to that point where it is it's very strong. It's, it's, it's not watered down. It's not some kind of weak, uh, if peradventure there's a possibility that God may save me and he might not. Uh, okay, we better get stronger than that. <laughs> we better get to, wow, I've been through a lot of things and what I'm going through now is really bad, but uh, I know that. <laughs> I'm going to glory in this tribulation because I know I know that this tribulation can work experience, or patience and experience, and at the end, God will bring me through. And I'll give me one more reason to hope in God. All right, that's hope in God. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance.